Hello team and welcome back to another episode of the Live Perform Compete podcast. Back in the studio today with Coach for Fitness resident physio, body shadow, Eleanor Hobson. Eleanor, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I've been uh, in your ear for a very long time about getting on this podcast and booking an appointment. You would have thought it would be rather easy given we work in the same place, but it's actually been quite hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and probably to lay on top of that, you are heavily pregnant. I am, yes. Uh, so some would say somewhat negative of me pulling you in here <laughs> in these uh, final weeks of pregnancy. Um, but Eleanor, great to have you on the show, and I'm really excited about our topic today, yeah, uh, which is basically going to be all about stress, uh, specifically relative to what you deal with mm-hmm. as a physiotherapist, specifically working with those in the training space. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we get into the conversation, uh, perhaps you just introduce yourself a bit. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi everyone. So I'm Eleanor Hobson. Um, I've been here at Coastal Fitness for two and a half years. Can you believe it? Mm. It's gone really fast. Really fast. Uh, two and a half years and um, I, I kind of classify myself as, I guess, a, kind of a crossfit slash high intensity uh, athletic or athlete type physio. So I've had a um, a lot of different phases in my career. Um, I started in a clinic, kind of like you normally do. I actually skipped the hospital rotations because I always wanted to work in, in musculoskeletal or sports physio. So I never went in and did the hospital rotation that you do as a, a baby physio. Um, and I started my career in a, a fairly largish clinic where I was learning and absorbing from as many people as possible, um, as quickly as possible. And then I moved into more of a regional center where you get a little bit of everything, which is kind of cool. So when you're out of the city, you literally see people uh, with all sorts of injuries and fun things and farming accidents and you know Achilles ruptures that have been ignored for months and you know kind of some extreme uh, cases of the body. Uh, which I also really enjoyed, and I really enjoyed the steep learning curve of being like kind of out isolated a little bit um, away from a team of city based people, so that you really had to think on your toes and try and work out how to help people best. Um, and that was really good, I did that for the best part of a decade, and I ended up uh, buying the clinic and running it and having staff under me. So I've trained people and I've taught people, and I've really tried to share my knowledge as much as possible. And then uh, when I sold that, I, I became obsessed with CrossFit, as many of us have. Uh, as an athlete myself, I uh, absolutely love it. Um, I've always been a bit of a, an all-rounder and a be great player in all the sports that I've played. So I've been you know, the 16th or the 17th player in every team uh, and often just missed out you know, on A grade and been like kind of the top end of the B grade, um, which is endlessly frustrating for me as a competitive person uh, and wanting to be a good athlete. So I, I landed in CrossFit um, and being an all-rounder is actually a super bonus which is awesome. So finally I found the sport where actually kind of being average at everything kind of accumulates and makes you um, sort of decent. You know, I'm, I'm a late starter in CrossFit, so I'm, I'm working on uh, trying to push the boundaries a little bit uh, on my CrossFit athlete career, which I believe is just starting rather than coming to the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, I've popped it on hold for a minute uh, as I have this baby, and then I will be straight back into it <laughs> I know you as quickly as I can. Um, and so I started working as a CrossFit physio, and um, along that journey, I, I was working in my box in Melbourne uh, in Geelong, and then I came here, and obviously I've been working here at Coastal. And along that journey, I've, I've really um, grown again as a physio, and um, expanded my mind, and really expanded my eyes into new areas of, I guess, physiological overload that we don't really see in that many other sports. Um, or Maybe it's not so much just the sport, but the type of person that comes into this environment and wants to push themselves and drive themselves. And, you know, we've got a high percentage of type A personalities who are often competitive and they're driven and they're successful and they have big jobs and big lives and big families sometimes and not much uh, spare time. And they come and they train early, they train late, uh, and they're training hard and they're really kind of pushing uh, putting the foot on the gas and foot on the pedal the whole time and, and working with this type of person has been really um, rewarding for me and, and fascinating and, I, and that's something that I want to talk about today, you know, how we manage uh, this type of athlete when they start to break down. Mm-hmm. What do we do and how, how do we look at which system needs some rest and recovery and how do we do that, of course, as quick as possible and as fast as possible so that we can let them get back because that's, that's in their essence. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't like to hold back and if you sort of tell someone like that, 
they need to back off, then, then chances are they'll just go somewhere else or they won't back off. So, um, yeah, it's been a real joy and here we are. So. Great, great introduction. Thank you. Um, actually, what you just finished talking about there, like the type A person, you know, the last podcast with Olivia Park, which kind of talking about that person. Mm. I know that's me, probably you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's 99% of people who train here at Coastal Fitness. But I think if, in case someone hasn't listened to that episode, you know, what are we talking about there? We're talking about people, you know, regardless of what it is in their life, they're very committed, they're all in, uh, they tend to do more than your average person. And in this case, sometimes to their detriment. Absolutely. Yeah, they, yeah. Have, they have a struggle slowing down. Uh, they have a struggle doing less. They mm -hmm. always want to do more. Uh, they don't want to do nothing. They always want to feel occupied, to feel like they're pushing a the needle forward. And, you know, as you said, that's what we're going to talk about today because yeah. you run into lots of problems. Uh, probably more problems than your average human being <laughs> when you're working with these kind of people. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's get into this. We, okay, today's, cool. today is talking about stress, and mm -hmm. I think um, why this is very relevant to me right now, and I know I talked about this in the last episode, you know, I'm just finishing off a two week deload, and honestly, well, for the longest it. time, in, I, I can't remember the last time in my life, I don't think I've actually ever, unless it's been on a holiday really, where I've voluntarily taken two weeks of a deload where I'm, I'm deliberately reducing training volume pretty drastically as well as intensity. Um, and this is, you know, come at the end of me realizing that I haven't been very intuitive. I talk about being intuitive, self regulate, all that shit, I talk about it all the time. Uh, and I'm now put my hand up to say I haven't delivered, I haven't executed here. Um, and, you know, as a result now, two weeks into the deload, I feel great. Good. I like, genuinely, it's, I, I'd forgotten what it felt like to have no pain anymore. You know, my shoulders, my wrists, my knees, all the old places I've had surgeries and, and injuries before have all kind of returned back to baseline again. And you know, it's funny because in the, in the cycle of stress that I was dealing with, uh, maybe I'll, I'll change that word, you know, before I took this deload, mm. I was genuinely thinking that this might be permanent injury. Right. Like I've been dealing with this pain now for two, three weeks, it's not going away, and I'm doing everything I can from a warming up, from a sleeping, from a cooling down, from a mindful practice standpoint, that's not getting better. Yeah. Maybe I've just I've just overdone it now, like permanently. Right. And now you know, having Scary. rested for two weeks, yeah. I'm like, well, no, it's just, this is this is another lesson then where you just didn't slow down and you, you needed the two weeks of rest. Yeah. Um. So you know, I know what we're about to talk about. Yeah. Is very um relevant to me right now. Yeah. And it's definitely something that we talk about a lot. Well, this is, uh, yeah. I mean, if I could sort of jump in Please. there, I mean, this is um, super relevant to me too, of course, because um, I think that one of the best truths that I've learned as a physio and, and truths that I've learned in life is that the body doesn't lie. Um, and, you know, the mind does and um, the personalities get involved and your interpretation of things, you know, can change and it depends on how you're viewing the world on that day, but the body doesn't really. So it, as a part of my role, I've sort of become somewhat, what I'm trying to, enhance my intuition around reading the body and not really actually spending that much time maybe listening to what someone's saying because that could change on a day to day and, and trying to really understand what the body is telling me um, because in essence your injury hasn't changed you know between three weeks ago and now um, or, or maybe you've had some healing but in essence if you've say got some arthritis or some sort of permanent change there um, that is ultimately not going to change that much in three weeks so why was it so much more painful three weeks ago than what it is now um, so so that representation of pain is something that's really interesting to me um, and it will up regulate or down regulate depending on so many things you know there's there's chemical reasons and there's mechanical reasons and, and that's kind of what we'll get into today is to um, I guess how the pain the pain and the way you feel can be really influenced by other features yeah okay let's get into it okay. so here's yeah. what we're gonna do team we're gonna break down uh, and identify four different types of stresses mm -hmm. and these are really stresses that Eleanor, you're dealing with as a physio probably on a daily basis those, those four categories are firstly aerobic stress then we're gonna get into anaerobic stress so those are kind of two stresses that are, are resulting from energy system training. Um, we've got mechanical stress, and then we've got cognitive stress, kind of stress between the ears and the, and the mind. Yeah. So what we're gonna do for each of these categories, we're gonna start by defining what it is, mm -hmm. uh, what causes this type of stress, and then what are some of the symptoms of this kind of stress? So you as a listener can probably identify, or try to identify if you're going through it now, or if you've been through it in the past, or hopefully, and this is something for the toolbox of the future that you can use as kind of like a, uh, 
a way to kind of screen yourself and, and prevent yourself getting to overreaching phases. And then lastly, if you are in this cycle of stress, what can you do to get out of it? So we'll talk about recovery protocols. Great, sounds good. Okay, so let's start, and I'm handing the mic over to you. Let's talk about the concept of aerobic stress. Right. Um, very prevalent in a CrossFit gym, that's for sure. Endurance communities, triathlon, long distance running, um, maybe even gen pop, you know, who, who are getting into kind of um, aerobic exercise and thinking that it's a healthy thing to be doing. But let's start by defining like, what are we talking about when we talk about aerobic stress? Sure. So um, I think it's relevant to kind of highlight that aerobic is kind of the opposite of anaero anaerobic, which is going to be the next category. So they kind of come a little bit hand in hand. And aerobic stress is really um, the energy system that you use um, to exercise. So when you're breathing hard or breathing heavy, you've got a lot of oxygen going into your body um, and your physiological um, demand goes up. And so you're using your uh, blood system, your heart rate goes up, your blood volume and your blood uh, pressure is going to go up a little bit. Um, and you're starting to exercise and get a bit sweaty and, and sort of perform in an aerobic capacity. So aerobic really um, is to do with the, the element of oxygen. So there is enough oxygen meeting your demands and you are exercising in an oxygen rich state. So yeah. that is that is where um, we're looking at the moment. So most people will be running, for example, if you're running, you'll be in a aerobic state and it's just yeah. kind of sprint bike or something really fast. Paced. I just want to jump in there and say it's really important to understand that pretty much all forms of exercise is going to involve the aerobic system to an extent. Absolutely. But what we're yeah. really talking about is like where the aerobic system is the predominant system. Right. So what type of exercise other than that will we typically see the aerobic system be most prevalent? Right. So if we're rowing or running or, or riding in the gym or if we're doing box jumps or um, even if we're doing sort of cyclical movements or we're doing barbell cycling or we're using dumbbells to do snatches and whatnot. Something where we're just continually, really moving. continually moving. We're not yeah. getting you know bottlenecks by muscle endurance or technique. Right. Like, you know, yeah. Right. And you're not getting like burning pains in your muscles. Mm -hmm. You can keep going. You know it's long, usually the longest time workout. So you know up to the 20 minutes or 20 minutes I mean, it could be 20 minutes up to, to 10 hours. Yeah. Um, so, you know, anything in the kind of longer category. Okay, great. So, what causes this type of stress? Because obviously, you're not saying that all forms of aerobic training mm -hmm. are stressful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when are you typically seeing uh, clients come in who are suffering from? from, you know, is maybe overdosing or overconsumption or a lack of recovery from high bouts of aerobic training? Right, so that's a good question. I mean, I think um, what people don't know if you're in high bouts of aerobic training is that it's using a huge amount of fuel, right? So, you know, you obviously have fuel that you eat and, and fuel that you metabolize to create energy to be able to exercise. So mostly the fuel that you would use in an, in an aerobic setting is your carbohydrates, um, sometimes protein you know, towards the end of the session, but mostly you're gonna be burning your sugars and your carbohydrates. So the stress of the system is to do with your, um, your meta, metabolic use of your fuel, and then also then um, your heart rate increase and your blood pressure increases and um, making sure that your muscles have got enough uh, energy from the fuel and also stimulation from the nervous system to be able to keep going over and over and over and over again. So you're at a, a lower percentage, um, but you're getting quite a lot of uh, electricity, if you like, sort of running from the brain to the, let's say, we're looking at cycling, to the quad saying, go, 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 right? So you get this kind of repetition uh, of information that's flying around the nervous system um, to make sure that you're kind of, kind of getting that use of your muscle system over and over and over again. Yeah, and I think it's really important. Well, I mean, we'll let we always kind of do this reference of like thinking back to hunter gatherer at times. Mm -hmm. You know, as human as a human species, we're never really designed no, to be doing all. these like you know fairly working at high heart rates for prolonged periods of time. Yeah, I mean, you know, you'd even say that 20, 30 minutes is quite long, but then you're looking at ultra marathon and, and, and you know long distance events, whether mm -hmm. it's cycling or swimming or rowing. You know, where they're doing. You know, we just had a bunch of clients do a marathon road for charity. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just had a client uh, cycle the equivalent of Everest. Yeah. Uh, had a client do 100 kilometers the other day. You know, these are all sports that are actually, you know, really building an interest but as and popularity. But as a human species, we're not really designed to really be doing that kind of effort. No, we'd probably, not, we'd no. probably you know, be walking on our feet, picking berries, hunting meats, and then sit down for a long period of time, rest, recover, yeah. and then kind of repeat. And, and I just actually listened to a really interesting podcast with Peter Atia, 
who's a heart surgeon, uh, puts a lot of great content out. He, he's like the longevity guy. Right. And uh, he was doing an interview, I can't remember who he was at interviewing with, but what they said was, is if you're running more than 15 miles a week, okay. yeah. you're no longer training for health. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. That's not much, is it? Right, yeah. So, you know, what the, what they, what the biggest study, and again, I can't remember the name, but, you know, the, the book Born to Run yeah. was written about this guy, I can't remember his name, you know, he was a bit of a hippie, uh, you know, basically moved to Mexico, ran with the tribes there, uh, and was like clocking like serious instances, minimum 50 miles a day, mm -hmm. and, you know, he died at 40. Right, wow. Just really recently, yeah. and, you know, they, they looked at his heart. Yeah. and found like extreme like uh, you know stress issues of the heart the right. ventricle nature which had been like you know pummeled so so hard and actually had created you know, yeah. the cause of his death so it's almost like a wear and tear if you like in your heart and your yeah. blood vessels and your lungs and, and the systems that are trying to provide oxygen to, you know, throughout the body to yeah. keep you going yeah yeah, and I, I mean, I don't want to scare off every crossfit or every endurance athlete listening to this, but you know, I think that's a whole other conversation, like you know, health versus performance. Mm. Um, okay, so how does one know if you know what are some of the symptoms of aerobic stress? Right. So um, normally, if you've had a big session, and if anyone has, has done, you know, the boys who've done a marathon row will feel this. Um, what you'll feel is mostly fatigue. Right, so you sort of hit this low zone, I guess, after after the excitement of the exercise has worn off, um, and you just feel flat. So it's really to do with your energy kind of being depleted, or depleted is another good word for it, um, and you'll kind of feel just it's like it's difficult to get back up again. You know, you might feel like you want to sit down or be lazy or or something like that. Now. It doesn't mean that you can't get back up again. I mean, often people will do, and, and to be able to get your system up and running again, um, you will actually release cortisol, which is another, you know, form of kind of stress to the system, if you like, which is a positive stress scenario, um, where it will pep you up and get you going again. Um, but usually, you'll kind of feel like you've had a, a, some fatigue and a deficit of maybe you're hungry, or you know, you kind of feel like you want to lie down. So it's wanting it's a need for wanting rest yeah i mean typically after bouts of aerobic training you don't necessarily feel like localized soreness no or no. like you know extreme muscle fatigue but i mean certainly for me it's like i get uh, like a haziness mm -hmm. in the vision especially like early in the morning like lack of clarity right it's feel just generally a bit slower i have this weird thing where my eyes blink a lot slower mm -hmm. after a lot of aerobic and i just yeah. have i kind of realized that i have my own uh, like twitches, I guess. Right. Uh, as a result of aerobic training, yeah. I get unblocked ears as well. Interesting. Yeah. I have. I get a flicker on my eyelid. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I mean there's those symptoms are normally symptoms that the nervous system is quite fatigued, yeah. um, and in, and you're demanding your body's demanding um, some neural fuel. Actually, you, you need the fuel to revamp the system to make it sparky and bright and clean again. So yeah, brain brain fog um, and, and kind of like a little bit of twitchiness, or some some people say that they get like ants crawling in the skin or kind of symptoms where um, you're feeling just unsettled or restlessness or something like that can come from that um, nervous system burnout a little bit. And a question then, if someone is suffering from, you know, excessive aerobic stress and they're coming in to do a weight training session, right. might they feel the effects of the aerobic work? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, well, for starters, I'll probably feel kind of boggy to get going. So, um, if your nervous system and your CNS is a little fatigued from the aerobic activity, um, you'll be thinking about it like kind of running it, running dim, if you like, or kind of like someone's turned the lights down. So, when you start trying to lift and you start trying to get your muscle system going, it's kind of slow and boggy, like you're, you're running in mud. Um, craving and more coffee. Craving more coffee, yeah, or like you're going to hit that, you know, fit aid and you're going to get the RX1 because you want that extra little <laughs> bit of BCAs or a bit of extra caffeine or something yeah. like that. So, so you're looking for something to pep you up. And then usually if you've had a good warm up, um, you know, you will be able to pep your system back up. But again, that comes from the release of the cortisol from, from your hormone, uh, your thyroid release. So your, your brain recognizes like, okay, it's not going to stop today. Um, we better help him out, otherwise he's going to you know, drop this weight on his head. So you can normally get yourself back up and running again, but it's a real slow start, you know, so you yeah. need to really like have a good warm up and it just feels boggy and horrible, it's hard work. Let's, I like that, that example of like your body needing cortisol to kind of save you to, yeah. to do the activity yeah, you want. Right. Yeah. And then I think the problem with that, it's not necessarily a problem, but the problem occurs with over dosing that right oh, so absolutely. like you know yeah. day after day 
where your body's crying for you to just slow down and rest. Mm. You know, you're asking it to give you more cortisol, and we only have finite resources. Oh, most definitely. And also, I mean, this is a whole other podcast in itself, which I'm, I'm quite passionate about as well. But with that over release of cortisol, over demand for cortisol in your system, you'll start churning through some other things, and the main one really is your electrolytes. So, um, if you're running through cortisol all the time, you'll actually end up quite dehydrated. And when you're dehydrated uh, in your muscle system particularly, you will feel flat and boggy and slow and like it's dim lights again. So it's really the same symptoms as the, the aerobic overload. And so what do you do? You release more cortisol. So you actually run into this really negative cycle where you've got cortisol release and then electrolyte burnout and dehydration and over fatigue and you start spiraling downhill and you start heading towards what maybe would look like a chronic fatigue syndrome um, or I mean sometimes the doctors tag it with a diagnosis like a myofascial disease or a type of arthritis or something like that so the danger is is that we've got a whole bunch of diagnoses that, are, that come off very vague symptoms and these vague symptoms uh, sometimes lead people uh, into a real kind of booby trap um, and they can get stuck in, in deficit for quite some time yeah i think what we can probably agree on is that cortisol is going to be prevalent regardless of the type of stress that you're dealing with. Yes. Right? All the stress that we're talking about today, cortisol has a major role in that. Right. Um, and probably is a large contributor to why we start suffering from it. So sticking with aerobic stress. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, when you have people who are coming into your clinic, mm -hmm. or just people in general who, okay, they've identified they have these symptoms, they've, they've looked at their training, they've probably seen, okay, I've actually been probably dosing aerobic training quite heavily recently. This kind of all makes sense now. Yeah. What do I do? Great. Um, so, I mean, first of all, the type of athlete, I mean, you mentioned this before, but um, triathlete comes to mind. I mean, they probably have one of the biggest sports I know, and, and it's all aerobic, right? So they're really trying to become experts in three sports rather than just one sport. And, and if they're doing an uh, Ironman or something like that, obviously the, the distance and the volume is huge. So um, that is the kind of type of person, person or athlete that I'm often seeing in this state, but um, regularly in CrossFit too. Um, and really, um, you need to do kind of two major things. So one is eat well, right? So you've got to refuel your system. So you have to refuel your system um, with all of the things that you have run into a deficit. So mostly um, it's a carbohydrate-based system. Um, you will need protein most definitely, but maybe not as much as if you're doing, say, heavy weight training or something like that. So you will need some protein. You will definitely need to refuel your carbohydrates. Um, and also then your electrolytes, as I mentioned, because you're gonna be kind of running a deficit from the cortisol. Um, and then you need to actually put your body into that parasympathetic position where you get an opportunity to rest and recover and absorb those fuels. Um, we won't go into the depth of it today, but the nervous system also have its, has its own fuel, and you'll find that in your micronutrients rather than your macros. So um, the micros that are particularly relevant to the nervous system fall in the vitamin B category. So um, your vitamin to the English vitamin to the Aussies, um, and I'm a bit half and half, so I tend to switch <laughs> between the two. But uh, your B complex vitamins are actually quite critical for yeah. um, your nervous system. But you know that can come with some issues as well because folic acid can be a little aggressive on the system, and sometimes you need need valproate rather than folic acid. So that's content for another day. Um, but certainly making sure that you're getting your refueling in uh, with a good diet um, and whole foods, and you know making sure you're getting those those individual ingredients back in, and then spending some time in the parasympathetic state, which is really Rest, rest, rest and recovery. Yeah. Love Get that, that mind quiet. <laughs> yeah. You know, all the stuff you were talking about with Olivia, the difficulties of being quiet, you're gonna to have to fight with that. Yeah. Um, maybe you meditate, maybe you sleep, maybe you you know, whatever it is that you kind of put your boat, but you've gotta find a way to chill out. Nice, love that. So, okay, on the nutrition part, you know, what we're saying is that you know, we need to get the calories in, specifically yeah. carbohydrates. Yeah. This is often where nutritionists will program a refeed. Right. You know, where they'll actually they'll ask the client or the person to overfeed, uh -huh. eat more than you typically would in this period where you're in this deficit and you need the recovery. Uh, but you mentioned a really good point there as well, keeping the foods clean. Mm. I think that's uh, very relevant because often when we're in a state of stress, um, you know, we've overdosed aerobic training, the digestive system is also often compromised as oh, well. Yeah. And so, you know, if you put shitty foods in a, in a compromised digestive system, we're going to have poor, poor digestion, poor absorption, and that's going to lead to a whole, you know, a whole other host, other host of uh, digestive 
tract issues and absorption issues. So you know, keeping it clean uh, and prioritizing carbohydrates and you know the mindful part as well. You yeah. know, trying to trying to slow down, force yourself to rest. You know, doing things like you know massage therapy. Yeah. Anything that kind of helps you switch off and relax is, is a good thing to be doing at this point in time. Yeah, that's definitely. Okay, that was awesome. Cool. Okay. One we're moving. Done. Yeah, one kind of done. Next one, we're talking about anaerobic stress. Okay, so let's start by defining okay. what is anaerobic stress. So anaerobic stress is um, when you're using uh, the energy system, again, to create output, um, but this time you are without oxygen. So it's usually over 80%-ish, you probably know better than I do actually, yeah. on that. Um, so when you're working at high intensity, you're looking at sprint work, jumping, bounding, um, you're breathing hard and heavy, um, often with air, you know, through uh, the open prep style training where you're doing kind of lots of combined movements one after the other after the other after the other with limited rest and you're, high intensity. Yeah, you're heading towards the, the red line yeah. basically so. I, think, I think that's a good way to put it you know whenever you're getting close to that red line you really you know put your pe- you put your foot down and then pushing hard yeah i think again it's also really important to because you know you may i know we'll have some energy system buffs out there who are going to say well uh, aer- <laughs> the aero oxygen is always Present even in our anaerobic style training, but, right. you know, like we said, it's like the anaerobic system is dominant. Right. In this type of Absolutely. Training, yeah. Sure. So I sort of I feel this really comes in where the demand for oxygen actually um, is higher than the ability to get the oxygen in. So nice. you're actually running a little bit of oxygen deficit in your in your body systems. Um, even though you're breathing hard and heavy, you just can't quite get enough in for the demand because your muscles are going hot and heavy, and you really need to keep moving. Yeah. Okay, where we might see this in CrossFit mm-hmm. is doing things like very, very high threshold interval work. Yeah. You know, where you're going like you know, 20 to 30 seconds and resting might be good four, three, four, five minutes between intervals. Yeah. Uh, whenever you're doing hard fatigue based training, so you know, where you're pushing to probably beyond your red line, mm-hmm. like doing an actual open workout or a competitive tester. Or probably like most people in the CrossFit space, every day in your training, yeah. where you're just going right. so hard <laughs> to the point that your output just slows down <laughs> and you, you reduce to a crawl. Yeah, that's kind of where we typically see, right. you know, the other So, system so the air, the air bike and more balls come to mind uh, for me, but you, yeah. uh, but you know, of course, the stimulus can be different for everyone. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so that's kind of defining what it is. Uh, what causes this stress? I guess it's just you know overconsumption of that and the lack of ability to recover unless you put anything else in there? Um, no, no, not necessarily. I think yeah. it's just, again, what I think probably the thing that people need to know about this system is that without oxygen, you start running some metabolic waste products. So you're going to get that buildup of lactic acid or lactate in your muscle system. So that's quite um, easy to feel. It's quite a unique sensation, and it's basically the burning pain in your muscles where you know you can hang on and you can do three or four more reps but there becomes a point where you've got too much metabolic waste product like lactate or lactic acid and it's going to make you stop mm. um so so you will hit the wall so to speak at some point in time mm, nice um okay so what does one feel mm. when they are dealing with anaerobic stress or stresses from Right, so the burning muscles, of course, is one of them. That's kind of in um, the moment, right? It's in the moment, yeah, and it clears very quickly. So as soon as you stop and you're rolling around, you know, half dead on the floor and, and you're making a, a sweat angel, um, you'll start to get more oxygen in, your muscle output is less, um, and so you'll start recovering back towards kind of the aerobic system. So, yeah, the anaerobic, um, the lactic acid burn lasts maybe, you know, what, five seconds up to 15 seconds or something like that. Uh, depending on how, how how hard you've gone, um, but that's the the main symptom really. I mean, I think you're going to feel muscle fatigue, not necessarily muscle soreness or ongoing muscle yeah. soreness, but like muscle burning and then muscle tired. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely think you know an assault bike all out effort. You know, you can definitely feel localized build up in something like the quads, especially yeah. quads. You just want to chop your legs off, type right. feeling. Yeah. Or you probably get it, you know, when you're pushing a prowler or a sled mm-hmm. really, really fast. But what about also, you know, especially when you're doing repeated efforts of that, mm-hmm. you get to a point where there's like complete and total body shutdown. Yeah. You know, where like you wipe in the face. And I think this is probably the aerobic system's coming into this now as well. Right. You know, whenever you're doing repeated efforts of anaerobic exercise, the aerobic system's playing an important role in trying to recover the athlete between the sets. So perhaps that's not actually 
you know, specifically anaerobic fatigue, but what do you think? True, I mean, I think there's no such thing as staying in anaerobic um, training you know, exclusively, because if that were the case, we wouldn't get anywhere. It would last like 10 seconds, mm. and, and then you, you have to recover. So, you know, your body can't work without oxygen, so you'll hit the red line or slightly beyond the red line, and then you'll, you'll be forced into a rest period, and when you're in a rest period, then the oxygen will catch up, and you'll slip back into aerobic, and you'll start anaerobic again on the next set, and then you'll start to hit back towards anaerobic because you push right. yourself harder. I think also um, it shouldn't be forgotten that we can do this in weightlifting too. So you're looking at like you know higher rep schemes um, at maybe medium high percentages, so somewhere between kind of 60 and 75 percent, and you're doing you know maybe um, like four or five sets of 10 or L10, 8, 7 or 10, 8, 6 or something like that. Maybe even with some holds at the bottom, mm-hmm. you're going to feel those squats burning. Yeah. You know? So you, you hold a back squat for long enough, and it's going to come on. Yeah, and again, the, the, with all these types of stress, there's like always a grey area, yeah, right? Course, yeah. Because like, yes, the anaerobic system is 100% you know, being used when we're doing squatting, but then so is the mechanical system, which we're going to talk about next. So is the aerobic system. Because, Absolutely, you yeah. Know, high repetition work. So, you know, often, you know, we're talking about the principles today, but there's never, for most people, never just one of these things at hand. It's usually a combination, you know, of a bunch of them. We just have a may have one of them that's more dominant. Yeah, absolutely. Others. Yeah, and even in a training session, you know, you often start off with an, an aerobic piece and then maybe a strength piece and then you might do some anaerobic threshold work. Um, so you're training all three systems or four, you know, four areas all in the one session. Yeah. So how do you know which part of your body um, needs recovery? And, and I think the answer is all of it does. So yeah. you have to start to learn yourself a little bit um, what you need to do to recover, which is why this topic of recovery is so broad and so interesting, and why so many people need a little bit of help because it's difficult to identify which system has become the most overwhelmed um, and which one you're the best at recovering uh, yourself as well. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so if someone's listening to this and they're like, yeah, this is me, <laughs> I'm, I'm in this state right now and I'm struggling, yeah. uh, what do they do to get themselves out of it? Right. How do they recover? So this one is particularly within the probably two days or so after you've had the stimulus. So as opposed to the aerobic stress situation that can last you know, a week or so or maybe two weeks, this is a little bit more kind of in the moment after the training session. So what really happens is you get the metabolic waste product sitting in your muscles, so your lactic acid particularly, there's some other ones, but that's the one that creates the burning sensation, um, needs to be flushed away. You need to get rid of it. Right? And the way that you get rid of it is to clear it through your lymphatic system. So um, there's basically uh, kind of two systems in your body that are like uh, tubes or, or kind of vessels. And so you've got your blood vessels as one system and your lymphatic system is another set of vessels. So unlike the blood system, which has got a pump and there's always blood flushing through it and moving readily and it's easy for the, for the blood to move, the lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. Right, so I like to kind of visualize this as like having a garden hose in the garden, but the, somebody's detached it from the tap. Right, so the hose is sitting in the garden, but the, there's fluid in the hose, but it's not really moving very well. Right, so it's just kind of sitting, you know, flat on the garden floor. And you know, let's, let's say it rains, for example, and the garden starts getting wet, um, and some of the, the water from the garden is leaking into the hose because there's holes in the side of the, the tubes. Um, as the total pressure in the hose goes up, then you'll get some slow fluid movement through the hose and eventually it will drain out the other end. Mm. Right? So in our bodies, the other end where it drains out is your bladder. Right? So this, this lymphatic waste product is heading towards your kidney uh, and your kidney will filter out what it wants and what it doesn't want and then you're going to excrete or kind of wee out what you, what you don't want to keep. So there are some ways to recover faster uh, by speeding up this lymphatic flow. So if you think again about the garden hose, you can stand on the garden hose, for example, and you can squat the hose, and it's gonna shift the fluid forward. So um, we can use a number of techniques to help the fluid move through the lymphatic system. So things that come to mind are, say, um, some active recovery. So if you were to get on the bike and and do some really gentle cycling with lots of oxygen, so you're not getting into the anaerobic state again, because of course that'll make you worse. So just a slow, steady bike ride means that you're pumping your quads, you're pumping your calves, you're pumping your muscles, which means that you're squashing all of those tubes. And as you squash the tubes, the fluid's gonna move and your your clearance or elimination system will speed up. Uh, So that's one active way to do it. Just hold there. Sure. (laughs) Because what you said was bang on. Right. We need to just remind folks what 
easy aerobic training than actually looks like right. recovery based training. Okay. Looks like. Yeah. Good shout. So yeah. I always, I mean, I just try to say, look, if you if you get to the point where you can't have a conversation yeah. with someone yeah. comfortably, then you're probably already going too hard. Right. Anything else you would normally EQ or use? Right. So I mean, this should be like a three out of ten effort. Mm. Yeah. Maybe a four. Like you're just sitting down there, just cruising along, you know, on your phone, catching up on your Instagram or whatever it is, and, and you're just literally just cycling your legs around. Yeah. So it's easy, you really shouldn't be stressing your system, you shouldn't be churning through your carbohydrates. Um, yeah, and if your heart rate is getting up a bit, you, you need to back off. Okay, cool. Yeah. So active recovery is so one So active one recovery is one great, great way to flush your elimination system in your, as, yeah, your lymphatics. Um, another way is compression, uh, which is quite helpful. So there is some pretty good data to show that things like compression types and stuff do help. Um, because what they will do is, again, they'll squish the garden hose and help the fluid movement through the lymphatic system. Um, so that's moderately helpful. I think most of my clients and our athletes don't really rely on that. But maybe if you were in a um, kind of competition situation and you want to give yourself every opportunity to recover, I would recommend that people sleep in some long leg skins or, or two times use or whatever brand you like um, to compress uh, the system. So by the same token, water will also create compression. So the bigger the body of water, the heavier the water, therefore the more compression you get and the better drain you'll get. So the gold standard for water compression is the ocean. Um, so I'd say hop in the ocean and just do something. I mean, you don't even really need to swim. Just if you're under the level of the water and the water is compressing you, you will get lymphatic drainage. So it's quite nice to then do your active recovery in the ocean, which is a you know, massive bonus because you're using your muscle system and you're getting compression. And you're really going to flush out a lot of that fluid and metabolize. So um, that, for everyone's interest sake, is why you need to pee when you get out of the pool. So a lot of people will find that and they'll notice that they need to the lure as soon as they get out and it's because their body is starting to flush which is which is awesome mm. um so yeah so compression from water uh compression from compression clothing um and then compression potentially from massage is really helpful too or or things like those compression boots um so the air boots where you stick them on and then they squish you from your ankle all the way up to your thigh and then they start again um that's what they're designed for you know, yeah. they're designed to actually help uh, move your lymphatic fluids so that you can recover quicker so how would a how would a lymphatic massage differ from like a uh, like a, a myofascial massage, right. for example? Right. So a lymphatic uh, massage is really designed to drain the lymph system or the lymphatic system, uh, as per its name, which means that it's not deep. Right. The lymph drains are just just under the skin. So it's actually more like a sweeping massage, just that's light and it feels quite nice if you kind of fall asleep. And the idea is just to move water up the system. So we also um, don't want to get into the complete nuances of it, but there's some buckets in the lymphatic system. So along the way, your garden hose will actually fill up, a, say, a bucket, and then when the bucket is overflowing, then it will go into the next part of the hose. So the buckets obviously slow the system down again. So the tubes drain into the buckets, and then you get this moment of slowness until the bucket fills up, and then as the bucket overflows, and then it moves again into the next uh, section. So the buckets sit in your joints. So you've got buckets in your ankle, buckets in your knee, buckets in your head, uh, and of course there's upper limb as well, so elbow and shoulder and, and around um, the collarbone and stuff. So what we would do often in a lymphatic massage is that we would sweep the skin until the fluid has moved through the drains into the bucket, and then we would try and squeeze the buckets to try and overflow the fluid out. So we would do, say, like some repetitive knee bend followed by some repetitive hip bend uh, to try and kind of squish the fluid uh, up the system and get it moving. Um, and this is really super effective. If anyone's ever had a lymphatic massage, you know that you can go from swollen to not swollen within a session. Um, and often then you get up and, and sort of 20 minutes later you're on the toilet and you're weeing it all out, which is, is really lovely. So um, in our sport, obviously this is really relevant for recovery, but it's also relevant in things like um, after operations or after injuries, if you've had any, you know, like a, an ankle sprain or something, you need to get that fluid out. You need some lymphatic drainage and it will, will clear much quicker than if you hadn't had it done. Um, the other side of the coin, like you said, was a remedial massage or a myofascial massage is much deeper and it's in the muscle tissue and you're, you're really looking to try and create some release in the muscle rather than just sweep the skin. Nice. So that's the difference. So we've got active recovery. Yep. 
we call it compression. Yep. And if you're really smart, you pair those two together, you get in the ocean where you get compression and active recovery. Yep. That's and then it. we've got some like lymphatic massage. Perfect. Awesome. Yep. I really, really love the garden hose analogy. Oh, good. I've never heard that one. I'm going to use that and steal it off you. Yeah, it's a good one. Go for it. Awesome. Okay, Eleanor, should we move on to the next one? Yes, please do. Okay, yeah. very relevant this one to the weight training population as well. Anyone in kind of resistance training. This is mechanical stress. Mm -hmm. So, Eleanor, what is mechanical stress? So, mechanical stress, I guess, is um, it's uh, when you have a load on you and you're creating a muscle activation, right? So, let's say you've got a barbell on your back and you're going to do some back squat reps. Um, you're getting some movement demand on your on your quads, particularly quads and glutes. So your quads are pulling or contracting, um, and they are pulling on their tendons to create your knee to straighten or your knee to bend. So it's the movement demand on the skeleton that comes from the muscle activity. So um, there's a number of uh, structures that are involved when we talk about mechanical stress. So there's the stress to the actual muscle when it contracts, right? So if you think of it in its extreme form, if you're maybe looking at a cramp or something like that, yeah. where you get a really forceful activation of the muscle. Um, and then of course, muscles have got tendons, which are on either end, uh, and it's the tendon that attaches the muscle to the bone. So you're gonna get stress on the tendon from that activation. And then also you're gonna get stress on the bone from the tendon pulling on it uh, to try and create movement. So. Um, depending on the body part, sometimes you can get just bony overload or bony stress on the attachment or sometimes it actually becomes joint stress if then the, the movement pattern will, will create like a, a deep motion in the joint. So uh, it's a little bit complicated if you don't understand the anatomy, but there are at least uh, three to four main elements here. So we're looking at muscle stress, tendon stress, bony attachment stress, and then joint stress. Okay, and, and these type of stresses come generally from uh, like, does it have to be loaded training? What if you're doing like body weight calisthenics? Can you get mechanical stress from something like running? Absolutely, you can. Yeah, I think um, the so if we go back back a step to say calisthenics, you're looking at kind of a lot of um, global body part movements. Anytime you have movement and pulling on the tendons and ligaments, um, you're going to get some sort of mechanical stress. So yes, definitely, and, and jumping and landing and all that sort of stuff. Um, with running, of course, you're getting muscle activation stress and therefore tendon stress and therefore joint stress. But you're also getting gravitational loading stress. So that can come from ground reaction forces, um, landing on each step um, is going to be a force that needs to be uh, absorbed by your body. And so then that can create joint stress and tendon stress yeah. and muscle stress yeah. as well. So it's quite complex, but it is definitely um, kind of relevant to start to try to understand it a little bit. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a way to, to kind of put this into layman's terms. You know, I think if you're if you're like a, a bodybuilding type protocol where maybe the loads aren't necessarily heavy, but you're working the muscle tissue to somewhere very close to its failing point, and you're getting that local burning. Let's say it's in a bicep curl, and you know you're feeling like you know you're feeling the muscle fibers tearing. Actually, they, they actually cue sometimes to think about that. Think about tearing your bicep right. as you're doing it, and you know obviously the repairing process where it comes back bigger yeah. and stronger. Um, I, think, yeah. I think I think one of the easy ways to understand this is if you're getting DOMS after you train. Right. So you know you come into the gym maybe for the first time in a while and you do some some bench press or some bicep curls and then you've got sore arms the yeah. next day. Now that's not anaerobic threshold pain. It's not um, it's not fading. Right. It's lasting for a couple of days or you know up to a couple of days. And so that sort of pain is maybe an indicator that you've stressed your muscle system. Nice. Um, yeah. I like that. And I think okay for someone who's doing like really heavy. Uh, compound movements like squatting, deadlifting, or maybe Olympic lifting, mm -hmm. you know, where they're doing low repetition, yeah. the time under tension per set is a lot lower. You know, they're someone who may suffer from mechanical stress, but more so on the joint and the ligament and the tendon. Right. Right. And they're not they're not taxing the muscles so much. Right. And they're probably not going to come in the next day and have 
muscle doms from doing a heavy single in a back squat. Yeah. That they may feel some residual achiness or right. yeah. pain in like the, the hips and then the knees and yeah. Spine. You, you well, no, yeah, definitely. And another time we kind of see this is maybe like at the end of a training block, like if you've been progressively mm. increasing your load and your volume for say four to six weeks, um, you're going to start feeling this around about the week five, week, week six mark. Yeah. Where kind of things ache a bit, you know, you get a niggly shoulder and a niggly knee, and um, you know, if things start niggling. You, you feel like you need to start warming up more. Yeah. The mobility protocol for yeah. your workout starts to get a little bit longer every time. Probably Absolutely. a good sign that yeah. you're dealing with some mechanical stress. And also this is a good time to note that um, the mechanical stresses um, go up and down depending a little bit on your level of flexibility. So if you're somebody who's very, very flexible uh, and you're quite mobile, and I, I'd love to kind of maybe use Alicia Boone as a, dem a demonstration of this point here. Um, we know that she's a gymnast and she comes from um, kind of a high level of performance in gymnastics. Um, and now she's in a weight training environment because the skeleton is relatively mobile and flexible. The demand on the tendons is a bit higher. So yeah. the risk to getting some sort of tendon injury can go up. And I'm sure Alicia can identify with this a little bit. And I know she's done her Achilles a couple of times. And you know, it must be endlessly frustrating because the tendons have got to work hard to keep the skeleton yeah. still. Um, for somebody who's really kind of stiff and doesn't move very well, on, uh, like, like yourself, Ed, yes. <laughs> um, this uh, is still relevant, of course, but um, it's probably more accumulating under like a, a, a heavier, heavier sort of set where you've done like four to six weeks of heavyweight training. One to two um, weeks. <laughs> and you've been trying to hypertrophy those pecs to get, yeah. get your muscles bigger. Um, or get, trying to get trying to get that knee fix and get those quads bigger, yeah, and then so and then there's gonna maybe hit a failure point at some point where yeah. your skeleton is feeling overloaded. Okay, cool. So someone's identified that this is me. I'm yeah. dealing with some mechanical stress. I've right. been doing weight training and and various forms of exercise, which would be stress in the muscle, the mechanical system. Mm -hmm. What do I do to get out of this? Wow, good question. So there's lots of things you can do. I think probably what you need to do is maybe identify um, which pain, I mean, people have pain really. So let's start, I guess the symptom is pain. It, it can be different types of pain. It can be muscle ache or it can be joint niggly pain or it can be kind of around a tendon or maybe you touch your tendons like if you squeeze your Achilles and they're, ooh, they're a bit spicy uh, where it really shouldn't be, it should be pain free when you touch your Achilles. Yeah. So um, the symptom really is pain, uh, niggly yeah. pain. Oh, how about also like a, a loss of range? Like I often find uh, like I get tighter uh, yeah. when I'm dealing with more and more mechanical stress, I'm yeah. always pulling me out of my end ranges, so I feel like sometimes there's blockages, right. you know, right. in the movement, specifically yeah. for me and my shoulders. So um, I've had that described to me as feeling like you're muscle bound, which I think uh, CrossFit yeah, really got too much cheap. muscle. <laughs> They're too big. No one's ever said that, but maybe. I think that's unlikely, okay. I'm afraid. Um, bigger is better, but bigger and looser is better. Mm. You know, not, not bigger and tighter is better. So, yeah. Um, yeah, if you've got someone who's really healthy with nice, great big muscles, they should be quite soft to touch rather than kind of holding tension. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Like feeling like you're trapped in your muscle system and you're kind of losing some range because you're so tight all the time uh, is, is another symptom for sure. So what can, what can one do? So, so you, you just said you've got to try and identify. Identify, it. yeah. Oh, like if it's, if it's muscle tension, you're feeling muscle bound, then things like massage, muscle guns, roller, spiky ball, you need some sort of mechanical release to the muscle. Right? So you've got to be touching it and kneading it. Right? Now there is a difference here between uh, releasing a muscle and stretching the muscle. So um, stretching a muscle is really specifically designed to increase the length of a muscle. Uh, but releasing a muscle is designed to reduce the tension in it, which is quite different. So if you think about, say, a ball of glue tack, for example, um, if it's all bound up and it's tight and it's in a ball, and you try and stretch that sort of inverted commas tight bit of glue tack, well, what will happen is you'll take the ends and just pull the ends out. Right, so the tendons will get the stretch load, uh, but the ball will stay a bit balled up. So to get a really good change in that in that bit of blue tack, you've got to knead it out, make it a sausage, and, and then you can stretch it, and then all of a sudden you get some really great stretch benefits. That's uh, again another great analogy. Now, how would one know if they need to be stretching it or releasing it? 
Uh, that's quite tricky. That's where I would recommend that you actually go in and see someone and get some advice. Um, I mean, if you are tight in your muscles, you usually can feel it. So touch your muscles and see, are they tight? Are they firm? Do they hurt? You know, do you feel like you need to put the gun in the shoulders and all that sort of stuff? Um, and if that's the case, then, then it's probably a muscle tightness. Um, but if you're tender to touch on the tendons, which is really like around the joints, so like I said, if you touch your Achilles and it's sore, or if you're sore on your elbow, like kind of where, where it should be bony, and that's more tender, then it's probably more of a tendon overload rather than the, the muscle overload. Um, so there are different treatments for different parts, uh, which is where it gets a little bit complicated. So okay, you maybe so seek some help here. Yeah, let's, so, so let's talk about the, the tendon issue, like mm -hmm. a tendon and joint perhaps. Right, sure. Um, what, what can one do to try and to help, help get out of that state? Right, so uh, let's assume that there's no actual injury here to the tendon, that the tendons have just been overloaded by tension in the muscle. So actually the, the release to the tendon or the way to heal the tendon is to release the muscle. Um, above it. So actually the massage techniques to your muscles will also help deload the tendons. But the major critical difference is that you've got to realise how much more time you need. So with a tendon overload you need to release the tension or the pulling on the tendon uh, so that it can, it can recover um, and then you need to give it the time to recover. So you know if you've only got some mild mechanical overload to a tendon it's going to recover quite quickly. Um, if you've had this a long time and it's accumulating and then your tendon actually is becoming quite thick and quite Six, so we call it a tendinopathy, which literally translates to tendon sick uh, or tendon sickness. Then, then there's a whole protocol that goes with that. So you have to deload it, and then we reload it. And when we reload it, we're trying to lengthen it out. So we're looking at eccentrics and not concentrics. Yeah, and trying to stay away from contraction load to the tendon uh, and really looking at some lengthening and stretching, stretching load to the tendon instead. So it's about a little bit of understanding which phase you're in, and if, if it's early phase and you've just got a little bit of tightness, you know, a bit of massage is going to help. You're going to yeah. get on the roller, you're going to feel a whole, a whole lot better, and the problem goes away. If you've been ignoring it for six months or something like that, and, and you're getting some tendon changes, then you really need to respect that um, and not get it worse, and then understand how to recover it. So that, that is when I would suggest that you reach out and you see your physio or, or someone else, your chiro or your osteo, or whoever you've got access to, um, even your myopathy therapist and just talk to them about how to deload the injured area yeah it's always a tough one i can always empathize with people because you know you always get told you know if you get injured don't just stop moving you know keep on training train around it but there are sometimes issues that you actually just need to actually you know take a break absolutely and, and allow yeah. healing to actually occur yeah but you know i certainly know that i've just been through myself in the last mm -hmm. two weeks uh, and I actually you know just the whole time you've been talking about the tendon part and touching my left because <laughs> I can feel you know uh, patella tendon being a little bit like right. a bit sore the last couple of weeks but it's getting better every day yeah. but I can definitely feel you know that is okay that's definitely a tendon issue more than anything muscular system definitely feels like it's much more supple right. uh, having had two weeks of, of rest but that's something that's taken definitely longer right. uh, to kind of get back to it. To I, think, I think now is a good time to highlight as well that it's normal to have no pain. So, I mean, of course, everybody gets changing pains all the time, but if you touch the other patella, you know, it yeah, shouldn't you hurt. You have one. <laughs> <laughs> you <didn't> have one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, no, <laughs> find another it tendon. Hurt. It hurt, yeah. um, but it, it's normal to touch your tendons and for it to not hurt. You yeah. know, you, so if you're touching a tendon and it hurts, then your body's telling you something. Mm. Your body doesn't lie, right? So it lie. it's telling you, oh, I'm, I'm not feeling so fresh today. Yeah. yeah. Okay, lovely. Okay, let's move on to our last one. Oh, the tricky one. This is a tricky one, and it's probably something that, <clears throat> this is cognitive, this is not cognitive stress, so it kind of right. stress of the mind. Right. And I would guess that as a physio, this is probably something you deal with the least of the four. But, as in, I should rephrase that. People come to you not thinking that this is the problem. Right. They're coming to you because probably they're seeing other issues happening to their body, but the cause for those issues could actually well be cognitive stress. Yeah. And then you probably end up having to be something like a life coach, <laughs> you know, psychologist, <laughs> and working on something else completely different to what they thought they were coming in right. to work with you. Yeah. So let me hand it over to you. What, what are you talking about when you talk about that kind of cognitive stress? Okay, so well put. Um, this is definitely an area where physios have to multitask and, and try and uh, cover all bases a little bit. And so, coaches. And sure. coaches, of course. And, and anybody working with anybody else, right? I think if you're working um, in a client-based industry, you'll, you'll recognize some of this for sure. So cognitive stress is really, um, I guess, one of the analogies I like to 
say to people is like if you've got a busy mind. So busy can be anything. Uh, it can be positive busy or negative busy or a little bit of both. Yeah. It usually is both at the same time. So maybe you've got a, a busy job and lots of people are demanding things from you and you've also got a couple of kids and you're trying to work out their schedule and um, you also want to figure out when you can train and you know when you go to the supermarket and oh god I mustn't forget that it's mum's birthday next week and you know I guess lots, lots of busyness uh, in your head and sometimes it can be worry and sometimes it can be pressure from work or I've got to perform in this way or I've got to hit my targets or whatever it is, your mind is alive. So um, it's it's a lot of busyness in, in the king of the nervous system. So your nervous system is really kind of split into two areas. So you've got the brain being, being the king or the queen. Uh, and then of course the rest of the body is like the strings or, or the puppets uh, of the rest of the nervous system. So um, I guess a little bit different to the um, CNS stress that we talked about before was maybe more in the rest of the system. And this is more kind of mind based. So the type of stuff that will give you uh, cognitive stress is, is life overload. Nice. Really. Yeah. Okay. So um we kind of you just nailed it there you know what causes a kind of life overload good yeah um, overreaching which, a bit yeah you know it's like <clears throat> i think it's, it's always a hard one to try and describe to people because like you said it's not necessarily bad things no. the way i try to explain it is like a see it's a seesaw you know on one end of the seesaw you've got like inputs right. you know stress inputs and then stress inputs positive negative is anything that's bringing us away from homeostasis right anything break bringing us away from the norm now to keep the seesaw balanced, we have coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. the coping mechanisms can be things like sleep, good nutrition, meditation, mindfulness practice, Ex 20, exercise <laughs> if dosed correctly, Correct. 20 minutes of sunshine a day. You know, so where the imbalance occurs, when stress becomes a bad thing, is when there's an imbalance, where mm -hmm. the stress inputs are outweighing our ability to cope with them. Right. So what do we do when we have that imbalance? Well, either you get rid of some of the stresses, and, and, and organize those, or we increase our coping mechanisms. So we take, we do more sleep, we get outside more, we meditate more, we do mindful practices more, we minimize stress more, and we're always trying to seek that balance. Yeah. So if I can maybe add two more coping strategies to that, yeah, um, but I'll, I'll get to what they are in a second and tell you why they don't think that they're important, is because um, when you're in that stressed state, positive or negative or total stress state, um, again, you will churn through quite a lot of the fuel um, that you, you need for your nervous system. So um, of course the coping strategies also include things like getting some you know, vitamin B, <laughs> here we go again back on the Bs, but getting those Bs in um, and also looking at your electrolyte balance because you will, um, when you're kind of in a stressed state, your cortisol levels will be high, your adrenaline levels will be high and you'll be really churning through a lot of extra um, micronutrients you don't necessarily realise that you're, you're burning out or running out of and some of those micronutrients can be really hard to get from your diet so um, you know B, particularly B9 is really difficult to get in your diet, you have to have um, a lot of um, chickpeas, a lot of quinoa, you know, some lentils, and sometimes, you know, maybe more Western style, like the way I eat. Um, I don't really have foods like that, um, so it's difficult to get them. And, you know, yes, you can get them from your strawberries or your raspberries and your, your berry blackberries, but you need to have a lot. So if you've got training stress and life stress and work stress, and there's quite a lot of high levels of stress, you often would need, say, four or five pints of raspberries a day. So to get that volume in, it's got to be A, deliberate, um, and B, it can end up being kind of expensive and, and uncomfortable because, you know, five pints of raspberries every single day can be a lot. So this is a field where I think supplementation can be really helpful. Um, but unfortunately, the tricky part is knowing what, what it is that you need to supplement because yeah. it will be different for everyone and it really depends on how you eat and kind of how well you absorb food through your gut, like you said, and looking at your, your well-being as a whole and trying to figure out where is the biggest deficit and then starting to look at filling those deficits. So that is a, is a really great coping strategy that goes with the rest of the stuff, but you must find time in, in rest, parasympathetic drive. Yeah. Um, is really important to allow your cells to turn over. So, you know, our bodies are always want to, wanting to heal. We always want to heal. Our body is working in our favor. So when I'm looking at the body and it's not functioning and it's not healing, it tells me that there's a deficit there. So, you know, do you have a wound that's not closing up very well? Or is your sore tendon really just not getting better even though you're resting? Um, so that's a sign that the deficit is, is too big and you need to make some changes. Yeah. Um. I mean, you just we've just kind of talked about symptoms and recovery there. Yeah, we've so we kind of nailed both of them. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, this is as you were talking there. 
it just made me think about the last episode again with Liv, you know, and, right. and you know, this is cognitive stress is something you're gonna see a lot with type A individuals. Mm. You know, I said, you know, I find it very hard to slow down and to sit still and sometimes when I do I'm just craving something. Right. You know, it's like whether it's you know, working on the business or doing something to do with coaching or training or yeah. just doing something, playing guitar, you know, that that struggle to sit still mm. is, is also you know, a very big indicator that I'm probably over consuming mm. um, things that I need that stuff. I know you're really good, you just go home and nap. And yeah, you know, I'm a great you just, you can just yeah. it, Which is, you know, I used to always say like, that's such a good talent when people say that, but it's yeah. actually, it's a skill that can be, you know, taught and refined by anyone. Yeah. Um, but, you know, firstly, it's about understanding that you have the struggle and and to be you know real with yourself to yeah. identify and say this is not necessarily a healthy thing yeah and to try and find mechanisms and strategies to start dealing with it yeah and you know I know I, I know I can because I've done it when I've been on holiday uh, where I haven't had you know the stress of running a business and work and training yeah and I've been able to sleep beautifully every night and, and nap whenever I want right so I know I can do it but it's just you know so how do I then replicate that yeah. you know in, in so then I suppose if you, if you want to put this into like a real life example, you know, I'm a, I'm a perfect example of this because, um, you know, I'm going on maternity leave on Tuesday next week, so we're almost there. And um, of course, a lot of people are feeling a little anxious that maybe the support system or their, their deload is going to be uh, less accessible because I'm not going to be here to help. And so I've had a lot of people booking in and my diary has been really full and a lot of back to back appointments. And so I... Um, must make space for that in the rest of my life. So mm -hmm. if my work is going to be busy, which a lot of people's work is going to be busy, and they're going to not be able to avoid that, um, you've got to let something else go. Yeah. So or, or add uh, a coping mechanism. Yeah. For me, it's been both. So you know now I don't train during the week at all. You know I've taken Monday to Friday off. You know I'm growing a baby. I'm being a physio. I've got lots and lots of work, with lots of lots on in my head and my planning and. You know, 2020 has been a challenge for everyone, so there's a lot of mental stress there as well. Um, so I don't train during the week uh, much, uh, as I hate not training, but I, I recognize that my body just can't do it. And then I train on the weekend, you know, when in my whole day, I've got an hour and a half of training, and then I can choose to take the rest time afterwards if, if I need, you know, so then I eat well and I'll go home and I'll rest. Um, and then another strategy I've, I've added in, which like you mentioned, is to go home and, and nap. So I'll work for four or five hours in the morning and then I'll dash home and take a you know, 45 minute or an hour's nap and I come back and do the afternoon. And it's allowing me to carry on. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not really sustainable perhaps, or, or maybe it is, I haven't tried, but I'm now you know, 35 weeks pregnant and I'm still able to, to have a full time load uh, and be energetic in my life and, and really kind of healthy and happy. So it's all like just balancing the seesaw, really, yeah. like you said. So it does take a bit of practice and quite a lot of self-reflection to realize what you can achieve and what, when, you, when you're when you overreaching uh, and how to step back and, and give yourself the chance to get better. Yeah, awesome. Mm. Okay, Eleanor, well, this has been a really, really great conversation. I Genuinely think. really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for making time on your schedule. Uh, and sacrifice your nap. Have you had a nap today? I have not. You, you've been on apologies. It's Friday though, because you know, yeah, I'm the happy, weekend is coming. I'm happy I squeezed you in before you went on maternity leave. But thank you very much. Eleanor, where can listeners find out more about you? Oh, uh, so uh, that's a good question because you know Instagram and, and Facebook is not really my jam, as you know. Uh, I am online, so if you do reach out to me online, I will see you. Uh, you just won't find too much content there. Um, but probably that's the easiest thing to do, or you can shoot me uh, an email. So I'm Elena E L E N A at bodyshadowphysio.hk. Um, so you can you can do that, or you can shoot me a WhatsApp if you like. You know, I'm always available. Advice is free. You know, I try not to help as many people as I can. So you know, my mobile number is on my website, and I'm a pretty open book. So if I'm not available to help you, or I'm not available, I will certainly look after myself and close those avenues. But if you want to reach out, then, then please do. And I've got lots of resources that I can send out as well. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It was fun. That was fucking great. Oh, very good. I'm so relieved it's done. This has been a source of stress for me. <laughs> that was honestly really so, fucking good. Awesome. Excellent. Did you enjoy it with that? Yeah, I love it. I mean, I love sharing my knowledge. Yeah. Um, and so I, I really like it, but I... You didn't I seem stressed at all. Like a duck.
Yeah, no, yeah. you looked like you were super calm. That just felt cool. like me and you having a conversation yeah. in the video session. That's good. And I really, really, really like that conversation. Great. Yeah, oh, and I think, uh, I think that's going to make a really great episode. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Eleanor. You're welcome.